The following is a keynote speaker presentation from the ACM 97 conference, the next 50 years of computing. ACM 97 brought together over 2,000 leaders and luminaries from all aspects of the computing world to discuss and predict what the next 50 years of computing has in store. ACM 97 underwriters were Computer World, Hewlett Packard, Intel, Microsoft, and Sun Microsystems. Sponsors were Cadmus Journal Services, IBM, Netscape, Popular Science, Sheridan Printing Company Incorporated, Silicon Graphics Incorporated, SoftBank, and Unisys. The event also included a major exposition with a paleotechnic look back to the future from the year 2047, and a specially commissioned book, Beyond Calculation, featuring essays on the next 50 years of computing by luminaries and pioneers in the field. The ACM 97 conference was chaired by Robert Metcalf and emceed by James Burke. Details on how to obtain more information on ACM 97 follow this program. Ladies and gentlemen, James Burke. Our final speaker today is a real plus, because with a schedule like his, we didn't expect him to be able to accept the invitation to speak, but he found time, and we are enormously pleased that he did. Today, he takes the broad view well, I suppose you'd expect him to. He comes from a legal background and he's now in public office. He's the first man in that job to develop and expand an internet site that's now getting 14,000 hits a day. On that site, you can, for the first time, get copies of his organization's decisions, agendas, speeches, public notices, and their telephone directory. He introduced a fax answer on demand system for his clients. He's the organization's first chairman to involve himself in public online chat sessions and the first to have a personal computer on his desk and to put one on every employee's desk too and to make sure that all of them were connected to the internet. He's also about to give the organization an 800 number. He's committed to making his organization accessible to the general public. He champions the cause of competition, and he believes his organization should produce a clear and specific set of rules for the implementation of the sector of the economy with which it deals. He's a staunch defender of the public interest and for fair rules in business. Now, a lot of that would not surprise you if what you were expecting was a business tycoon. But if I also tell you that he wants to put the internet in every classroom by the year 2000, and that he can literally tell you how to make a telephone call, you'll know what I'm talking about. Ladies and gentlemen, here to speak about the particular relevance of telecommunications to the future of the information technology industry, please welcome the chairman of the FCC, Reid Hunt. Thank you very, very much, James. Uh, one eight 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 call fcc is our free telephone line. And that is about all I know about the actual workings of the telephone system. Last year, on Valentine's Day, Vice President Gore kicked off your celebration of the 50th anniversary of the invention of the electronic computer. Now, as it happens, the Vice President and I were born a year after the computer. 49 years ago this month, my birthday was yesterday, his comes 28 days later. Now all of you have computers, handheld computers, and you can do the addition so you can figure out when to send him a birthday card. But yesterday was March 3rd, my birthday, and that was the birthday of Alexander Graham Bell. How do you think I happen to be selected as the Federal Communications <laughs> Commission Chairman? I want you to know that March 3 is also the birthday of the inventor of the railroad sleeping car, George Pullman. This was a close call for me. <laughs> I could have been selected as chairman of the Interstate Commerce Commission, which, in fact, was put out of business by the new Republican Congress last year. The Federal Communications Commission, they only thought about shutting down. I will get to that a little later. 
In any event, as it also happens, being of the same age and growing up in the same town, it came to pass that the vice president and I went to the same high school. Now, there were differences between us. He was slightly younger. He had the prettiest date at the senior prom, a girl with the unusual nickname Tipper. He was the captain of the football team. He was a national merit semifinalist, and he went to Harvard. He also truly loved all science, and if he hadn't gone to Harvard, I believe he might well have become a computer wizard. I don't think I said that quite right. It wasn't that he went to Harvard. Uh, Bill, uh, Bill Gates explained this to me. It was finishing Harvard that was Al's mistake. <laughs> In any event, now that I've turned 49, slightly earlier than the vice president, and I am holding on for one last spring in my step, a irrationally exuberant year to what could at least colorably be called youth. Frankly, I'm delighted to note with disdain and ridicule the birthday of anyone or anything on the other side of the great divide of the big five O's. So, Mr. ENIAC, electronic computer, you are a dusty, decrepit, defunct 51. And I laugh at you. <laughs> a truth of life vouchsafed to one only as one reaches the 40s is that you are always as young as your ideas. And back home in Washington, the telephone and broadcast lobbyists, they call my ideas not young, but juvenile. <laughs> I will get to that a little later. In my job, the fact is I should have all the young ideas in the world in order to cope with the wedding of Bell's progeny and Mr. Eniac's descendants, also called the convergence of communications and computing. But instead, what I have done is I have taken the easy road out and I have brought you questions, not answers today. First, your computers have made my three children, age 8, 11, and 14, infinitely more knowledgeable than I was as a kid. And they seem to be getting the top sight described by the brilliant Yale computer scientist David Glertner. This is the ability, he says, to use the machines that you all make to manage and manipulate the world. But my kids, who seem to be developing this top sight, they have access to computers. What about kids that don't? Is it a problem that the majority of children in this country, a country in which one out of five children is growing up in poverty, is it a problem that those children do not have the opportunity to use the amazing things that you invent? Second, and this is a little closer to home, all three of my kids now want to use the single delightful computer that Michael Dell sent me and millions of other Americans by mail for $2,500 a few months ago. But I can't afford two more, not on my government salary, and where and when can I buy a top flight $500 PC, including a monitor and a real fast modem? And maybe the answer to this question is part of the answer to my earlier question about the have-nots. Third, my kids want faster and more reliable access to the internet. If we give them policies that will drive massive network-wide bandwidth growth, is it possible that that will change the way you build the things you build? Is it possible that that will be part of the answer to the first question? And fourth, my kids want library-like and TV-like convenience when they get to the internet. It is easy and entertaining and sometimes edifying to turn pages and channels. By contrast, the Internet's display of pages behind pages is not much more fun than a cluttered desk. And a long scroll seems to roll right out of those tiny little monitors that technology has stuck us with for now. So I'm not complaining, and don't misunderstand me, I know that I've come to the Rome of the information age. I'm not complaining, but could you please get us big, cheap, better shaped monitors and a different look to the internet in general? And if that means more of the push of TV instead of the pull of the web, that's okay with me. 
as long as my kids and the consumers have the choice of different kinds of pushes. I know these issues are maybe a little out of your jurisdiction, but as we all tell each other, computing and communications have or are or will be or might or could converge, and so I suspect an awful lot of the growth that I'd like to see you have will come from a better internet experience. Belcor, a name out of the telephone world, Belcor just released a study showing that the number of former internet users approximately equals the number of current users. In other words, they say, for everyone using the internet, there's someone else who tried it and gave up. Mr. Bell did not have this experience with the telephone. And as I recall from my personal history, the only person who ever told me she'd rather write than ever call me again was my date to that same senior prom where Al took Tipper. <laughs> Henry Ford did not have that sort of abandonment rate with the Model T. No thanks, Henry. I think I'll get back on that horse. This did not happen. So. I know that Belcor might not be a neutral arbiter of the question of internet usage, but possibly we in fact need a big bandwidth, user-friendly internet experience and products that meet the real needs of consumers in order to get that special chemistry that will drive computers up to the penetration rate of phones and cars and televisions 2.1 per household. And those are goals that all of us want all of us in this country, all of us here. Network PCs and traditional PCs. Well, I have been uh, privileged in my job to listen to debates about these two different models, and I would be perfectly happy from the policy perspective if they both were absolutely right. But both, I imagine, need to be configured on some assumption about the bandwidth of the networks. I was invited as the poor country mouse uh, from uh, impecunious government to the World Economic Forum in Davos in Switzerland. And um, my, I had the uh, shortest car uh, of any of the people arriving. And uh, as far as I could tell, I was the only one who came there on a uh, public airplane. And so it was a special privilege to be there. And, and uh, these leaders of the world, many of whom come directly from the industry represented in this room, they all said that they did not expect now or in the near future to have available to the residential market big bandwidth networks. The virtual bandwidth that Andy Grove talks about as being the model of today's PC seemed to still uh, be their assumption. Bill Gates said in the one meeting that uh, this was discussed in some detail that he thought the telephone companies would, in fact, do better in the future in terms of providing bandwidth. Uh, if I were in Bill's situation, I would really love it. But <laughs> if I had Bill's uh, perspective on this particular situation, I could understand where you would want to sort of jolly along and encourage the traditional telephone networks and possibly uh, have them strike some kind of understanding with you in terms of whether they would eventually figure out how to market ISDN. <laughs> I could understand why he would have a generous attitude about this. I read an article in the newspaper about a um, part-time girlfriend of Mick Jagger, who uh, the other day uh, gave an interview about the experience of uh, being his part-time girlfriend, and she said, quote, I hope I don't end up like him, old and scrawny. <laughs> this is the way I feel about our networks in the United States. <laughs> and I have a part-time experience with our network builders, and these are, fine, these are fine companies, but the fact is we don't have big bandwidth networks. We don't have networks that are configured to provide high-speed data connections. We don't have that business model seriously at work with respect to the public switch network. And meanwhile, private industry is going right ahead and seceding from the more perfect union that we were trying to develop with communications network and is building its own intranets with high-speed data networks and the combination of voice and video and data services provided by satellite and microwave hop and 
private links. In fact, the world does not note this very often, but the greatest piece of commercial spectrum allocated in this country is already allocated to private use, to the large corporations of this country who have more than 5,000 megahertz of spectrum available just for their use. These are the oil companies and the delivery businesses. These are probably many of the companies represented in this room. They have five times the spectrum that we've auctioned. And in our auctions, we've had $24 billion of business. So if you could get out those handheld computers, you could figure out that we've given a lot of valuable spectrum to private industry. In fact, the law does not even permit us to auction that because they don't provide the spectrum to customers on a subscription basis. And that was the limit of our auction authority. Well, we've given all the spectrum away to the private sector to build their own private networks. And we're watching private industry build these tremendously rich, big bandwidth networks. What about American residences? What about consumers? What about the public switch network? What about the people of America who are only going to be reached by the subscription services like PCS and cellular, LMDS, all the other alphabet services that we're trying to auction? Or they're only going to be reached by the local exchange company and the new entrants, if we ever get any, that really try to get into that market. And aren't we all vitally concerned with the fact that the residential users in America should be able to get high-speed data, big bandwidth, precisely so that they will then be able to put at the end of these big fat pipes all the things that you can imagine that they would really want to have under those circumstances. Now, I think that the answer to our search for a policy paradigm is pizza. I think if you're sitting at home, you can get out the yellow pages or you can make a couple of phone calls and you can find five or six places where they will deliver you small pizzas, medium pizzas, or large pizzas with lots of different toppings and they'll throw extra things on the side and they will drive out to your house and they will put the pizza right on the table and you can eat it and that's the way it ought to be with bandwidth. You ought to be able to get it like pizza. Now, I'm glad you're applauding and if I ever leave here, I will have left the last audience enthusiastic about this idea in America. <laughs> this is California. You know, if Odysseus had traveled through California, he never would have gone home to Penelope. <laughs> I started law practice here in Los Angeles, and I made a big mistake. I went back home in Washington. The law firm knew I had grown up there. They wanted someone who could speak the language. I was sent back. It was a big mistake. It's really nice here. Out there, in if not the real world, the rest of the world, nobody wants the change. Nobody wants to have the status quo shaken up so that you could order bandwidth like pizza from your house. And the reason they don't is there's a lot of risk in changing the status quo. In its service, service territories in Michigan, Ameritech right now has two out of every three dollars spent by consumers on communications. That's a pretty big market share. And if they get into long distance and they keep asking me if they can get in, and when they eventually get into long distance, they don't want the 66% market share of every consumer dollar spent on communication to go down. They would like it to go up. And so in the long distance business, SNET, the telephone company in Connecticut, which got into long distance earlier because they got a special pass from the Congress, they have taken 30% market share from ATT, MCI, and the others in the last year. GTE, which is in 27 states, has targeted high volume users and taken 1 million of the most lucrative customers in long distance from the incumbents, AT&T and MCI. So these local exchange companies, which right now collect 99% of all the revenue spent on communications on a local level, they would like to be bigger. We would like them to be bigger. We would like them to be better if that's what the market calls forth. We're not trying to pick winners here, but what I'm saying is if you would like to have bandwidth delivered like pizza, then you are going to need to have in this country lots of different pizza companies and lots of different bandwidth companies. And that means that we have to be in business. And we cannot be the Interstate Commerce Commission. And we have to understand in this country that if the country wants competition in the communications sector or in any other sector of the economy, You've got to find someone who will write the rules to break up the monopolies and demonopolize these businesses, but not in the old way. 
And the old way is that you'd go to a company and when you said break up a monopoly, you would divide it into two or three or different pieces. And that's how AT&T was broken up 13 years ago. I'm not saying it was a bad way, but that is absolutely not what we're talking about right now. We already have the local telephone market broken up. There are 1,500 telephone companies in this country. Each one is a monopoly in its own geographic region. Every one of them says we are being too aggressive in writing rules of competition that allow new entrants to come in. Just let me say one thing about that. Of these 1,500 telephone companies, each of which believes that its own market has been opened too much and unfairly to competition, not one of them is entering the market of its neighbor. <laughs> what is going on there? I know that not all 1,500 are on the same golf course at the same time talking about this business, but something is going on there. It might be that it is a very daunting challenge and an intimidating prospect to go into a monopolist market and to start with nothing, with no customers, and to have to build a network. And so our new idea of competition, and it's a very, very, very radical and profoundly good idea, is that the local exchange market will either be shared or bypassed and connected to, shared or bypassed, and both things are possible under the 1996 Telecom Act. So if you want to start a communications business like MFS, under this new act you get the FCC to write a fair rule that allows you to come in and to lease or rent or borrow or share the local loop and then disconnect that from the switch and presto, you have unswitched ADSL. And presto, you have a chance to market big, deep dish, large scale, pizza size bandwidth. That's the idea of this new law. This is not anything that any of us have ever tried before. And as usual, the United States is leading the world. And everybody is watching us and thinking, boy, maybe this time they'll fail. <laughs> the United Kingdom, they're just, James, they're snickering at us on this subject because they had a different idea. Mrs. Thatcher's idea was that she would promote the cable industry and they would build a separate line directly to the home. And Mrs. Thatcher, with iron determination, has excluded and her descendants have excluded and her agencies that she helped create have excluded all other possibilities. And if cable does not build the alternative infrastructure in the United Kingdom, they don't have much else going for them, except that lately, to their surprise, a wireless competitor arrived called Ionica that has the idea that a mobile telephone service doesn't have to be mobile. Fixed wireless local loop. And maybe that will give them another tool. But in our country, what we're saying is we're not picking winners. We're not promoting an industrial policy. We're just saying anything goes. Lease the switches or the loops, the pieces of the existing network, couple them up with your own pieces, or build your own separate network and get a fair interconnection price. It turns out that forward-looking incremental cost is not just arcane economics talk. It is the mantra that is the building of an information highway on a global basis. On February 15, the United States convinced 69 countries to enter into an agreement in the World Trade Organization that we have been working on for three years. And this is an agreement that every one of these countries will set up an independent agency to write the fair rules of competition and that this agency will, by rule of law, open the markets in those countries, all those countries, to new entrants, and that foreign investment will be welcomed, not shunned, and that interconnection policies, the ability to connect one network to another so that competition can work, will be adopted in all those countries. This is the way we believe to build the global information highway. Why did anyone ever agree to accept the American idea? I have an answer, envy. That is the answer. Right now, we're doing all right. 16% of our gross domestic product is in the information sector worldwide. It is 6%, and the difference between the worldwide percentage and our percentage is the job growth in this country that you don't see in Europe. 
It's the innovation. It's everything that is represented in this room that you don't see in Japan. And that envy is what drove everyone to accept our model. I sure hope we got it right. But we're going to give it a good run for the worldwide economic growth for the world's money. We're really trying to build a domestic information highway and a global information highway because we really believe that this highway, this network of networks, needs to be public, it needs to be widespread, it needs to be ubiquitous, and then it's going to need lots of cars to drive on, and that's the stuff that you invent. And the information technology agreement that we struck in Manila, coupled with this telecom agreement, these two agreements, they're not like any other trade agreements ever. They export an idea, they export a philosophy, they open world markets according to principles of law. We're not trading peanuts for peacocks or petunias. This is not a swap of exports and imports. This is a concept to have an information age and a 21st century global economy that at last will be an economy in which no single country's natural resources give it special competitive advantage. If you've got sand, you can have silicon. We are not saying here that the information age will be like the industrial age. We are not saying that your special advantage will be coal or the expertise to process iron into steel. We are saying instead that everyone can grow together here. Well, I sure hope this works because it's desperately important that the globe build a real thriving global economy. And all of this talk about competition I want to get back to that part I mentioned about my kids who have access to these computers. The Federal Communications Commission is supposed to vote, pursuant to the Telecom Act, on or before May 8, on whether we will or won't take from the retail revenues of all telecom providers in this country two and a quarter billion dollars a year and give that money to every one of 115,000 schools so that they can install the most modern networks in the world in two million classrooms. Will we do this or won't we do this? Two schools of thought. The won't we do this, those are the people who say, well, I don't want to pay. All the telecom providers, well, you know how it goes when somebody's talking about paying. You wouldn't mind seeing the guy next pick up the tab. It's very understandable, but if they all don't pay, then there isn't any one that it's fair to have pay. So somehow or other, they all need to pay. And the money needs to be put in a pot, and that money will go cycled right back into the telecom sector, which will build these networks. But it may not go exactly to the same people who pay in because competition will determine or should determine who takes the money out, so there's risk involved. Who are the other naysayers? There are people who say we don't have any reason to have government in this country. There are people who don't think we should have a Washington. I think Washington should be in California. That would be an easier solution. <laughs> but I do think that we need government. Abraham Lincoln said the purpose of government is to do what needs doing, but which none of us can do so well acting alone. There isn't anybody here who can build networks into every classroom in this country. There isn't any business in this country that can or will do that. But acting together, with this very modest amount of money, less than 1% of the total revenues of the education spending in this country, about 1% of the total telecom revenues in this country, with this very modest amount of money, our children can, in the immediate future, become the primary beneficiaries of the big bandwidth world. We spend in this country $88 billion a year, federal, state, and local government, on roads. So do you think we could spare two billion for the information highway roads? Well, I think you know which side of this particular debate I am on, and I hope that you will decide that you care about this too. It is about you at every single level, your business, the country you're in. And this debate is going to be raging in Washington and leading up to the 8th of May when we will have a momentous vote. And we got four commissioners and you could do this on your computers, but I've been told that three are necessary for a majority. So I would love it if you all would help us out. Thank you all very, very much for inviting me.